Um, thank you all for coming to the UMass Boston Nantucket semester student presentations. Um, we've been very lucky to have a great group of students here on Nantucket since February 2nd. Uh, lots of people here on island have helped support our students and I want to make sure and thank all of you all uh, that are here and make sure that people know how supportive Nantucket has been for our kids and how much they're not really kids, they're pretty much grown-ups, but how supportive the island has been to our students and how much it means for them to come and do a residential program here on the island. So we've had a total of six students participate in our classes along with two islanders that have come and sat in on specific classes. So this has benefited not only UMass Boston students, but also Nantucket as an island and the Nantucket economy. And one of the people that helped get this all started was the folks at Remain, uh, Melissa Philbrook, uh, Rachel Hobart, Verna Gonzalez, and of course, um, Wendy Schmidt have all been very supportive of this program. This is the third year for the program, run through the School for the Environment and the University of Massachusetts, Boston. And we have several students here that are going to be presenting their research. Um, before I get too far along, I also want to thank some community members that help the students with their research. And those folks include people like um, Andrew McKenna Foster with the Mariah Mitchell Association, Kelly Oman with the Nantucket Conservation Foundation, Peter Brace, who worked as both a uh, mentor and as a faculty member, um, Tara Riley and the folks with the Nantucket Natural Resource Department, including Jeff Carlson and uh, Caitlin and Leah, who's hanging out in here somewhere and set in with one of the classes. We've also had help from the Handlebar Cafe. We've gotten brochures and a special um, uh, offers for the students from folks at uh, Petticoat Row Bakery and some of our different island um, establishments and vendors. Um, we had a lot of help from Harvey Young at Young's Bicycle. And we've just really had a great time. These students have actually endured one of the coldest, hardest winters that we've had on island in a while. And they still managed to be outside working, doing research in the salt marshes, in the harbor, and in our moors and heathlands. So I'm very, very proud of them. And for folks that might not know who I am, I'm Dr. Sarah Oktai, and I'm the director of the UMass Boston Nantucket Field Station. But enough about me. We're getting ready to hear some great talks by four young women whom I'm very, very proud of. And um, they were all mentored and led through this entire process by the help of Dr. Elizabeth Boyle. Beth Boyle is our Nantucket semester coordinator. And Beth, why don't you come up here for a second and wave to the camera and say hi to everybody in the audience. Beth Boyle is a extremely good marine biologist that works through the University of Massachusetts School for the Environment and she coordinates this program year round. We're always looking for new students. We're trying to consider extending this into the fall, into the spring, but we'll be offering this program here on Nantucket every spring and it's a one of a kind program. Very few field stations around the country offer a res uh, residential opportunity for students to study while getting 17 uh, credits of classes. It's open to all students here on Nantucket too, and it's something that we hope more people here on the island will take advantage of and help us build into a bigger program with even more interesting classes. So do you, can you tell us a couple of the classes that are going to be coming up in the years to come? Um, yes. Um, working on um, developing a, a service learning course, which would be kind of a group project course um, where students take, tackle a project from the science to the civic engagement to engaging stakeholders, um, hoping to offer, um, oh, a history course, the um, environmental it, history. It, environmental history next spring um, with Conorary Valencius mm -hmm. and um, perhaps some coastal geology or invertebrate zoology or working on that. Population yeah, biology population stuff. Population biology, I mean, something like that. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks. Yeah. Um, a couple more people to thank before I introduce the students. Um, we have lots of members of the science community here on island that come and teach the classes and provide a, a more intrinsic opportunity for students to learn. And uh, Sarah Trainer boyce with the Len Loring Nature Foundation was very kind to show our students uh, a lot of the botany and how to use different smart tools for evaluating invasive plants. Um, we had teachers from the Wampanoag Nature uh, Nation, including Elizabeth Perry, and other faculty and scientists here on island that came and talked about different things for the students. So it made it, not only were the students coming to the Nantucket, but Nantucket was coming to the students. And that made for a class and, and learning opportunity that's way, 
way more uh, effective and uh, fun than other classes can be. So without further ado, the speakers in order are going to be, first Farah Ahmad is going to be our first speaker, then we're going to go with Alicia Steele, and then we're going to go with um, Mackenzie McDonald, and then last but not least is Serena Saeed. So those are the four students that will be doing about a 15, 20 minute presentation. If you have questions, definitely ask questions as we go along, or you can save your questions to the end, whichever works better for each of the students. Here we go. Hello everyone, my name is Farah Ahmad and I'm um, a senior at UMass Boston and um, it's been my pleasure to be part of this great program on island and I just want to thank everyone for coming today to see, um, to see our presentations. So my presentation um, is the effect of snow cover decline and duration on New England salt marshes. I conducted my study on the Folgers Marsh by um, the field station. Um, Yep, so this is a picture that I took before sunrise, one of those days when I was sampling. And, um, can, yep, great, thanks. So um, I will start with a brief background about salt, the salt marsh ecosystems. So as you can tell by this um, Google Maps, it's the area that's, um, that acts as a buffer between the terrestrial, terrestrial and marine realms. And um, so it's affected directly by the tides when the tide is rising, or the tide, um, during high tide, like the water comes to, uh, through that creek, so a great portion of the marsh will be covered by salt water. And when the water is retreating um, during low tide, most of these um, parts are exposed. So uh, most of the organisms that, uh, that are part of a salt marsh ecosystem are adapted to uh, live in this harsh environment like when it's salty all the time and most of the two um, common most of the two common plants are Spartina alterna flora which you can see in this picture the picture to your um, left is off of the internet but the one to the right is taken on Folgers Marsh here on the island um, next um, this is Spartina patens and the picture to your right showing the um, dead plants. So like during the fall and winter when, when the plants die, it looks like that. So it's mostly like dry, yellow, and hay-like um, sort of environment. Um, so the plants grow and flower and spread their seeds during the time period between March and September. During the fall and winter, um, it dies off, or at least it looks like it's dead. <coughs> But in fact, the underground part of the plant is alive and it stores the um, nutrients and energy and rhizomes in the roots. And these will help the plant to regrow next um, spring. Um, the, the dead uh, stems of the plant act like the, process, the processes that take to decompose and decay these parts of the plants are um, a crucial part of the life on the marsh because it releases all these nutrients and energy that will be consumed for, uh, by the next level on the food chain of the marsh ecosystem. And besides ener providing energy and nutrients, um, the plants actually help building the marsh because when the tide um, comes in during high tide, it runs to the plant. The water runs into the plant, so it slows down and but when the water slows down, it can't carry heavy sediments anymore. So it, the plants end up trapping these sediments and therefore forwarding the marsh and helping building it um, up. Um, so why do we care? Why do we study uh, salt marshes? They are great biodiverse communities and um, they are uh, highly productive ecosystems. And unfortunately in the past, um, they have been taken for granted. Like they've been filled in to build airports or other um, constructions. And um, also they're important nurseries, uh, nurseries for fish and shellfish. So um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change suggests that we're experiencing changes in the global um, climate and 
we're seeing it now and it's not going to stop unfortunately it's going to happen more and more so some of the changes they're observing is an increase in the um can you go to the next slide mm -hmm. please an increase in the um, earth surface temperature and a decrease decrease in the snowfall and precipitation in general so how is that going to affect the snow cover when the when the earth surface is hot it's going to melt the snow cover faster so that like we have a shorter period that the marsh for example will be covered by snow and the changes in precipitation since there's a decrease so like not as many snow will fall so we'll experience like differences in the depth of the snow cover so how is that going to affect the ecosystems in new england a lot of people study the effect on hardwood forests, but none, like there's not a lot of studies that are done in a salt marsh. So some people study these, um, the impact of snow cover on the soil and how eventually affecting the plants. And that study was done in Vermont, and it took, um, it took them four years to um, assess the impact or the effect, and they come up they came up with the conclusion that when the, when the soil is exposed and there's nof nothing covering it, it's less protected. So it, like any change in the air temperature will affect it directly. So the soil is going to be freezing and thawing, freezing and thawing over and over and over. And when that happens, it's like the nutrients will escape from the soil. So eventually it will, it will um, affect the regrowth and the reproductivity of the plants. Um, so last semester, I was part of Dr. Jarrett Burns' lab at UMass, and he was interested in looking at how the climate change will affect the salt marshes. So he suggested that I conduct a study similar to the one that was done in Vermont, except do it on a salt marsh. So in Vermont, what they did is they picked different grids that were entirely covered by snow, removed the snow from what, some of the <coughs> grids, and then compared it that way. But I couldn't do, uh, do that in the salt marsh because as you can see from the picture, when the water comes in, if it's warmer, it's gonna melt some of the snow. So it's patchy. So some are areas are exposed already. So um, it was really hard to like pick an area that's entirely covered and then remove the snow. Like it didn't seem possible, especially within the time that I have, just two months here on island. So what I, um, yeah, so when I looked at the studies and saw like how long it takes um, for, for studies like to assess the impact and stuff, I decided what would be reasonable for me is just to collect initial data that will be helpful for future research because no matter how, ma like how many measurements you take in the period of two months, it's really hard to tell because there could be other factors affecting your study. For example, I've, I keep hearing that this winter has been really hard on the island, and in the past, it hasn't been like this cold. Um, oops. Break. <laughs> I can keep talking. I can go. So, yes. So instead, I picked, instead of like removing the snow and um, studying the grids that are covered and uncovered, I just picked random points um, on Folgers Marsh. And I would go to that point and see if, and take notes, see if it's covered or not. So about five or six of my points, random points, ended up being exposed. But the rest of them were covered. And um, so for, the peri for a period of two months, I would go back to these 70s points that I marked, um, see if the snow has melted or not, measure temperatures. And during the springtime, I tried to identify and um, keep track of the time when there was emergence um, of plants. For this slide, I'll just read off of the slide. My initial question was, is the decline in snow cover due to climate change going to affect New England salt marshes? And my initial hypothesis was, exposed soils are more likely to freeze and um, to freeze and thaw more, more than, are more likely to freeze and thaw than covered soils. When the, uh, when it freezes, it experiences nutrient loss. When the nutrient, um, 
when the marsh starts growing in the springtime, there may be there may not be enough nutrients in the soils. Therefore, there might be competition for nutrients as far as plant growth is concerned. So this is a map of my points. The yellow pins represent exposed um, sites, and the purple, bluish pins represent the sites that were covered. Um, yeah, so as I was saying, I observed conditions. Yeah, that's me. That was the day I got stuck in the marsh. I thought I was going to die that day, <laughs> but it was good. <laughs> so I would, um, yes, yeah, so check the condition. Keep an eye on when things start to melt and the whole marsh is exposed. And in the springtime, uh, see where plants emerge first. Um, you can move to the next slide, please. So this is um, a table of my results. It turns out that it takes, on average, about 17 days, 17.18 days for the covered soil to get exposed for all the snow to melt. And um, according to the data that I collected within two months, it seems like the exposed soils, uh, like the, there's emergence, plant emergence in the exposed soils before the covered ones. And as far as salinity is concerned, it seems that the, on average, the salinity is higher in the exposed sites than the salinity in the covered sites. And that makes sense, because when the snow melts in the covered sites, it's going to contribute, um, it's going to add fresh water to the side. Therefore, like, the salinity is less on average. Next slide. OK. So this is a graph of the temperatures that I measured throughout the um, marsh. So the vertical axes represent the temperature in Celsius, and the horizontal axis represents the date. The light brown line all the way at the top is the air temperature. The line beneath it, the turquoise line, is the water temperature. And the dark line, the dark brown line, is the exposed soil temperature. And the dark blue line is the covered soil temperature. So on average, it seems that seems like um, the exposed temperature, the exposed sides, I'm sorry, the average temperature for the exposed sides is more affected by the physical condition. So according to these data, the, the snow cover does protect the soil. Um, and like it keeps it segregated from the harsh winter condition. Um, next slide. Yes. So. For future research, if I would continue this research, um, I would start taking measurements earlier than the end of February, probably in the fall before all the snowstorms and before any coverage starts. Look at nitrogen levels and nutrients because um, the, like in the Vermont research, they were saying that when the soil freezes and thaws, freezes and thaws, the nutrients escape. So I would love to check on that. Also, measure the, uh, measure the temperatures at different depths, because this time around, I only did it at the five centimeter depth. And look at plant density, see if over time, one species becomes more dominant than the other species, and what is causing that. Um, that's about it. Acknowledgements, thanks for Dr. Boyle, Dr. Octai, and Dr. Jarrett Burns on campus for their support and help and encouragement. And um, that's about it for my research. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for listening. <laughs> As I was saying, I picked up random points. So I started with just like walking around the marsh, trying to find my points and see where they are. Beth provided me with a map, but um, it was really difficult at first getting around the marsh because I just, I've never been in a salt marsh, honestly. So, so I started with plotting the points and just check in whether the site is covered or uncovered. And um, yeah, so when I was done just like setting my experiment and finding my points and marking them, I was going back every week um, and measuring temperatures and like observing any changes. And changes uh, started happening um, after like within on average of 17 days. That's when everything melted and then Within 40 days of, my, of me taking measurements, I started seeing growth. That's probably about three weeks ago. It's very recent. Well, just when the air temperature started like warming up, it shows on that graph. Um, 
Yeah. So towards the end in April, see that peak air temperature? That's when I started seeing growth. Spring is here. Mm -hmm. Woo. Okay. Are there questions from yes. the Sarah? Um, so for the water temperature, was that kind of the average water in the marsh or what water sampling were you? Yes. So I picked three consistent points, and every time when I go back and measure the te soil temperature, I would measure the water temperature on that day. And on the graph, it shows the, uh, like, I measured it at three sites. So that's like the average temperature at the sites that I measured okay. per in day. In the creek. In the creek. In the creek. In, in, in the inflow of the. Yes. Yeah, not the soil. Right. Not the water in the soil. Yeah, in the creeks, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Sure. Um, just a, a, an observation, maybe a suggestion for you when you make this presentation again, which I hope sure. you will. Um, I'm looking at it from the perspective of a social scientist who, you know, works with natural experiments and says, what can you extract from them? And I think a, a really interesting aspect of this is, first of all, it's a natural experiment, but it's a bunch of natural experiments in a place where you, you know, you've collected data on different places. but. In, in one sense, it's a very fortuitous natural experiment because I think it's fair to say this winter was very, very unusual in the sense that the typical winter, um, when we get snow here, the snow hangs around for a day or two on the ground and it just kind of melts and disappears. And that's got something to do with our climate and just that's the normal way things are. But you happen to do this in a winter that I think is certainly probably not going to get more than five or six a century this bad where what you had in effect was a, a natural experiment overlaying a normal natural experiment that occurs every year in the sense that you probably have a distribution of points that is very heavily weighted toward points that didn't melt mm -hmm. relative to what happens on Nantucket normally. True. Normally it would probably be the case that things would melt quicker yeah. and that most of it would be melted away uh, and not much of it would be still covered. And so you might want to make that observation that it just happened to be fortunate that you did it this year. Someone repeats this next year and we have a normal winter, that will be equally informative uh, because it will, it will show just what kind of a mechanism was at work uh, imposed by the rare experiment of a very severe winter that really skews your data whole different direction, I think. And that, that's worth noting from a, you know, just when you come in and you take a look at something and say, well, I wonder what I can learn here in three months. You happen to be here in the right three months. True. Mm -hmm. <laughs> She's also doing conjunction with uh, the Burns Lab. They're, they were looking in the marshes near campus, which were completely covered in snow uh, for then, months. Right. So it's actually really interesting yeah. having yeah. this point, which is different than yeah. what they experienced. Is this going to be maybe part of a publication by uh, the lab director that you mentioned? Or? Yeah. Um, Good. Yeah, I like. Yeah, I haven't. I still haven't showed him everything. To be honest. Well, be sure to mention this to him. A little busy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. See you right away. I had a question about uh, the points that you established in the marsh. Have they been GPS? Yes. So somebody can go out and replicate the point at the marsh yes. where the sample has been taken. Yep. The other question was, has any soil sample been collected at those points? No soil, no soil samples have been collected. Because that might be an interesting follow-up. Yeah, definitely. Can. Nice job. Thank you. Um, one last question. I know you, know you highlighted the Spartina patents and the Spartina alterna flora, but were those the dominant plants where your points were? You know, when you said you were looking at emergence, were they kind of all of those plants or were there anything else that you noticed that looked like were For the most part, it was alterna flora and patents. The, actually, yeah, I meant to mention that. The dominant plants, um, or at least the one that emerged first, is the alterna flora so far that w I was able to identify. It doesn't mean there's no alterna patents, just probably alterna patents taking a little longer to grow. by the two colors for the covered and not covered yep. to give cool. people an idea of how it works in the marsh. Yeah. yeah. Nice. So it's a little complicated because <coughs> there's a lot of mixing. Yeah. 
of the alternate for and Peyton's. And so what she looked at was both what was the dead, the dead grass, which might have been Peyton's with a little bit of alternate flora, but the alternate flora seems to be coming up first. And interesting. What happens in two months could be completely different. So in two months we might have, you know, Peyton's may that overtake those mixed zones. That would, be, that would be interesting to know to add to. Yeah, maybe we do have maps over summer. time of the Peyton's and alternate flora distributions in the marsh and how that's changing each summer. So I think this would be a really good overlay because I think that's going to be the key thing with climate change is how those move. Yeah. Mm. They're more mixed than they're supposed to be according <laughs> to science. They're, um, according to the, the salinity and the amount of inundation. Nice job. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Hi, my name is Mackenzie McDonald. I am uh, a, technically a senior at UMass Boston, and I have been super fortunate to like spend three months on this beautiful island um, with the UMass Boston Nantucket semester, and I've learned so much, and I'm so happy, like really happy. Um, I did my research project on the northern white-tailed deer population. Um, I decided to do my research on them because I love them, and also, they are one of few mammals on the island. Like, aside from humans, they are the biggest mammal that occupy the island. Um, and I thought that it was very interesting, like with little genetic variation between them, because there's no deer coming in or out, that um, it would make for a good project. And I was curious to see what I could do with it. And with the help of Beth Boyle and Sarah Oktai, this is what I came up with. Um, the question I asked was, is there uh, an effect of climate variation on morphological traits in a northern white-tailed deer population? Um, I reviewed, oh, can you go back? Oh, sure. Sorry. I reviewed um, population ecology data on white-tailed deer on the island by looking at the Massachusetts Division of Fisheries and Wildlife records of annual deer hunts over time, specifically the years from 1985 to 2014. Um, and uh, with the data I collected, I investigated and evaluated uh, possible correlations between variations in annual average deer weights uh, as well as antler beam data for males. And I also looked at weather patterns such as total annual precipitation as well as growing degree days. And growing degree days, if you don't know what they are, it's a, it's a biological phenomena. It's, an, it's a way to track the um, time to return of the accumulation of warm weather days for the growing season. Um, and, and I wanted to see if these environmental factors affected um, morphological traits like the structure, like their antlers and weights as well um, in this population. Um, so let's go, we'll go to the the graphs and everything. It's a couple. I think it's another one. Yeah. Okay. So this, these, I did a bunch of graphs, and I hate Excel, but um, the this is the male white-tailed deer um, annual deer weights. Yeah, from 1985 to this one was to 2013. That like missing portion in there was there was no um, data for the one and a half yearlings for 2000. I think it's 2002. Um, and then the next slide shows the, the annual deer weights for the females as well. And they're relatively, there's slight variations, like where you can see that uh, the, the, bigger, the bigger mamas have a couple spikes, but relatively slight variations over the, the years. Um, we can do this, this, uh, this graph shows. Um, total precipitation versus weight in pounds of the male white-tailed deer. Um, and as you can see with the linear regression lines, there's still very, very slight variation, not much at all. And then this is the, the female uh, white-tailed deer weight per age class versus precipitation as well. And it was, there was a little bit higher, but, but nothing, nothing to brag about. Um, this shows um, antler beam data for <coughs> the male deers, obviously, versus precipitation. And I really, I thought that 
um, like the amount of precipitation we got and which you know you would assume would make plants grow more that it would affect their their antler beams like their size the size of the antler beams and how many um, yeah, the, yeah but just yeah the point <laughs> how many they had and then this is antler beam data versus growing days and again very slight variations and so I thought the effect of environmental variables on this species morphological traits would be much more largely indicated um, in annual weight changes and have a strong, it would have a stronger influence on survival and reproduction, but I didn't, I didn't really find that. Um, so yeah, from the, the graphs we see very little or slight variations between the weights, as well as the graphs um, that depict male antler beams of all ages and growing degree days and weights versus precipitation. And if there are any questions, I would be happy to answer. I hope I can answer. Are they getting, I'm leaving it on this deliberately. Are they getting heavier or lighter? Was there, are, are the deer pretty much staying stable? They, there's, a lot of them are staying stable. You know, a couple of them are like extra fat and like to eat, but like they, the, the, um, the larger ones, they, you know, they're, they're more um, habitat, like, ter like territorial, like they, they're going to do what they want. The bigger guys get, <laughs> get more. Um, See, there's a drop right here, for instance, with large males, and then it seems to be going up. Yeah. But it seems like there's a drop here. Does that like, correlate between years? Did you have a drop in the females, maybe? Um, I didn't. The same time period, if you stacked them all up. Yeah, it looks like there's a decided, yeah. very faint downward trend, but it's yeah. a meaningful one. Yeah. Does that pop back up or not? Can I ask a, just a dumb question? No um, question is dumb. How, how do you how do you know how, how do you know the weights of these deer? I know I know you didn't go out with them. Oh God, no! I got this information from good. yeah. I got this information from um, the Massachusetts the fishery. Uh, Division of Fisheries and Wildlife Association with my, from my friend David, and yeah, it now, was are, are those, a lot of data. Are those deer that have been killed? Yes. Oh, yes. They okay, were. They so, were. So you have some hunted. possible selection bias going on here. These are these are the ones who are in the. <laughs> they're not all like, above average, yeah, as they say, right. like Wobegon. They're right, the right. ones that did get shot. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. But it's it's a long term since she stayed within the data set. Yeah. From yeah, year to year, yeah. it's the same collection yeah, methods. Yeah. So this is the first time the Division of, of Wildlife and Management has released deer records to us uh -huh. to evaluate over time weights and antler beam lines. Yeah. So I have a question but, yes. specifically yet to this figure. So I have two questions. So first of all, I'd love to see some of the variation. Um, so we have, I guess I'm assuming that line is like the average for each year. But um, if you had kind of like a comp um, within each year that variation, because I think that would be in interesting and informative to see how um, much it within year variation there is in that in the weight. Um, and I'm also curious, um, just having a husband who's a hunter, I know a little bit about from year to year. Sometimes the um, and especially in that 30 year period, the amount, the duration of the hunting season is very different. The number of tags for males and females and antlerless deer versus, you know, like a spike horns and just like, there's a lot of different regulations and they change over time. So that could also be a way to tease out more information from the data if you're looking specifically at females um, and, you know, the duration of the hunt know if it's a month or if it's two weeks or you know just because that would help um, maybe get at some narrow down some of that variation. But that's true. Yeah, that is true. You no, know, if they collect the data, do, do they, they just come out once a year collect the data during the hunt? Don't yeah, they only come out once a year, so they. This is based on what? The, another oh. researcher could actually look at the hunting. I mean, that's something that a student could do, is actually look at the change in hunting times throughout, throughout the year. Throughout the year. Throughout the year. <laughs> throughout the year. Um, and this is just the official Division of um, Fisheries and like Wildlife data. Come out 
Yeah, so they come out for the first week of, sometimes two weeks of shotgun season. Okay. And the uh, UMass Field Station has been providing them housing now for 30 years. And so this was one of the first times anyone asked them to look at their, their deer data. They have looked at how healthy are the deer uh, in relationship to their population, which is a, a point of their weight. Mm -hmm. And our deer yeah. are, are pretty healthy. They're not super skinny. So the, the main thing they've looked at is weight over time to see if that's reflected on population. So they do have scientists that look at this overall numbers and population size. And there's a couple of new papers on the antler de uh, bean uh, size that these guys looked at, uh, that Mackenzie and, and Dr. Boyle looked at, to try to get an idea of how to effectively look at that. What would be nice is to compare this data to another county in other parts of Massachusetts or in Connecticut to see if there's a difference in weight for our deer versus other counties. And the Division of uh, Wildlife and Fisheries seems to think there would be. Yeah. So then you could compare genetic differences across. The amount of information that they shared was phenomenal. Like, I didn't realize how much, like, data they took just you know, from being... She does have the variation, just was trying to summarize everything initially, yeah. and that's the next step, definitely. Yeah, just being unique on the part, you know, if you're looking at, um, like, is the purple liner the oldest here? Yes. yes. And how that one seems to generally fluctuate the most. Yes. But to see kind of like the, like a confidence and a, like an upper and lower on that line would be interesting to see if it, mm -hmm. if it really is. Yeah, there's, I, there's really some interesting aspects of these data. You know, when I look at this as a demographer, the first thing we would do is say, well, you know, what's, going, what's, what's misleading you with these data because of the selection bias? But at the same time, uh, I mean, I think you say, you know, these are the data I, I got. This is all we have. It's a, you know, the, the kingdom of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. <laughs> and I can see two things going on here. One is the point that you made, which is I think you have greater variability uh, among the older deer, mm -hmm. which may be, you know, these are the geriatric ones, and they may be more <laughs> vulnerable to something that's going on out there Environmental factors. than yes. the younger ones. That would be an interesting thing to tease out, and, and, and I think that's just a getting the right statistical test. And the other thing is that I think you can just tell that there is a downward trend in all of these. And what you should do is try to summarize that in some elegant statistic and say, yeah. well, what I can tell you for sure is however the data are biased and whatever is going on, they're slowly drifting downward. And we don't know how to interpret that. It raises a lot of interesting questions and Definitely. possible hypotheses, which then leads you to some other county, and you say, well, is the same thing happening there or not? Mm -hmm. And I would, what I would do is when you write this up, I would you know, put in a nice healthy section that talks about all the limitations of the data, and then say, despite these limitations, we can see a couple of interesting aspects just from a statistical standpoint that we can say things are heading down and it looks like they're Life is uh, is more contingent the older you are as yes. a deer. So they just dropped below 120. I think that's yeah. really interesting. The last yeah. since like 2008 or so, the weights all across the yeah. board for all age classes yeah. decline. Um, but it doesn't seem to be quite it. Well, it still does for females yeah. too. So all these and you can just take out the two outliers. And, you know. yeah. <laughs> but there's something going on here that you know would inspire the next student to say, maybe I can take it the next yeah. step. Uh, if uh, I could just follow up on that <clears throat> from a management standpoint, it would be interesting to compare the trends that your data are showing against the trends of other districts within the Commonwealth to see whether or not that downward uh, trend in, in size of deer is matched by other County districts in the Commonwealth. Right, okay. I'm sure that they probably have all this stuff sitting in a computer yeah. up in Westboro that they can push the button and answer that question yeah. for you. But it would be an interesting comparison to see if, if what's happening on Nantucket is comparable to what's happening out in Pittsfield. Yeah, our deer are an isolated population. That, mean, that means it's yeah. a distinct natural experiment again. They you know anything about this? Is it true that only one deer settled on Nantucket originally? That that's what I thought what's, because what's I read that. that but no, no, I the real story is I, that there were deer on Nantucket. Really? Yes, we ate them all. 
So going back, to, when we look at places like um, Folgers Marsh or, or Shell Biddens, we find many, many, many deer bones going back, you know, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 years. So yeah. they were indigenous to the island, and I've written about this a couple of times. Uh, and then yes. they were extirpated. Exactly. Yeah, extirpated. We ate them. They were tasty. The Wampanoags ate them, and then the colonial, you know, colonists ate the last time. <coughs> and then supposedly, and this is where the term apocryphal comes in, that, that <laughs> one of them was brought over onto the island, and then someone brought um, That's other, the story of old Buck. That's the story, and they're sticking to Lots it. Of you know, obviously yeah. they got over here somehow, and I think bringing them over is the only way to do it. Yeah, exactly. So presumably, they're a genetically homogeneous population, but the, yes, there could have been a few that did not get eaten. Yes. And then that's where... That's more likely the is. real story, is that even though we thought we ate them all, I'm sure there were some hanging out. Yeah. But regardless, the population was low enough that people didn't know Realize they were long. here. Yeah. So effectively, small enough, that, that would be the bottleneck genetically. Yeah. That would be interesting to look at the genetics and then, mm -hmm. yeah. Compare that to the mainland and see you can see what the variability is genetically in them, and, and that kind of answers your question for you without having to dig up someone from the 1920s. To they, they uh, said that they had more information, but that it was so, it, like to enter it would have taken like a long time. Yeah. So it could be mixed in with that, like with that. Well, meanwhile, the title of your favor is "Deer on Nantucket." Leaner, but not necessarily meaner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good title. That is, that is good. I might, I might have to quote you on that. You installed a couple of deer cams, too. Yes, um, that, that pic those were my pictures. I, I took the cutest ones and the best one. Like, but that was, that was my little cutie. I dubbed him mine, so none of you can have him. Call him Max. Yeah. <laughs> Do you hunt, Sarah? I don't. But your husband is. <laughs> we cook them too. Any other questions before we go on? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Um, all right. Hi, my name is Alicia Steele. I'm an environmental science student at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Uh, we've been very fortunate to be able to do research here the last few months on Nantucket. And uh, I chose to do my research on Folgers Marsh as well. Um, so you can see here in the pictures, there's a barrier beach that separates Folgers Marsh from the ocean. On the left, we have a picture of it in 2012. And then on the right, we have the same barrier beach. It's a different angle, but you can still see the difference between in the elevation uh, and the amount of sand that's present on the dune. And on the right, this is, that's a picture during one of the big storms that have been really common here uh, over the last you know, 10 years. Len took these pictures and he and Sarah have been seeing this a lot <laughs> over the last 10 years since they've been here. We had 2005 was a really intense winter. 2012, we had Sandy. 2013, we had um, Nemo. And then this year, we had Juno. So this has been, this is what the storms do to the marsh, to the, sorry, to the dune. These waves come over the, the dune and they wash right into the marsh. And that's not something that typically happens. Um, during a normal tidal influx. So I was curious about looking at where the sand is going and how it could potentially be affecting the marsh. Um, in order to understand how sand might affect the marsh, it's important to understand what a marsh is. And Farah did a really good job explaining, you know, why it's some of the reasons that they're important and what, what a marsh is. Um, but I would like to point out that specifically the soils in the salt marsh are a very unique type of soil. They're made of peat, uh, which is a very fine grain sediment. It holds a lot of moisture. And this, the amount of moisture that's, that it holds and um, can definitely determine what's cap able to live in the sediments. And that's, that's one of the ways that the marsh could be changed by sand coming in. Um, why are they important? Why do we care about them? They're, smelly, they smell like rotten eggs, what, why do we want to take care of this habitat? Well, uh, there's a few reasons, and I think that they're overlooked a lot. So one of the main reasons is they make great nurseries for the fish that we like to go out and eat. It allows these fish to repopulate by coming in. Their, their juvenile forms have a safe place in, in the salt marsh so that they're able to repopulate, and we can continue to fish them and enjoy these, these, these fish. <laughs> um, it also, Pro provides a 
buffer against storms. The spongy characteristics of the peat absorb a lot of the wave Act, the wave energy that come in as we have these storms. So it helps protect against erosion, which is super important here, especially on somewhere like Nantucket. Um, and it also stores a lot of carbon. So there's a lot of photosynthesis that happens in a salt marsh. Uh, and photosynthesis needs carbon dioxide in order for the process to, to, to begin, basically. So um, av once these plants use up the CO2, they store it as carbon in their leaves, and the, the carbon is held in the salt marsh. It stays there because the decomposition process of a salt marsh is very slow. The, so, the peat is, uh, there's not a lot of oxygen in the peat because of the tidal influx. It's covered with water so often that not a lot of oxygen gets into the soil, and that slows the decomposition process. So a lot of that carbon is stored there. Um, so how did I find where the sand is going and how much is coming into the marsh. Um, I looked only at the front ha half of Folger's Marsh. I split it into three sections. So I have the front section, the middle section, and the back section. And I took three cores in each section. Um, I took, the, that's a picture of the Russian peat core. So it really does, it looks like a pogo stick without foot pegs. <laughs> so you kind of, it would probably have been easier to use if it had foot pegs. Uh, trying to get it into the frozen soil was not easy. So, so I stuck it into, you stick it into the ground, you turn it and there's the little flap up there. It scoops the surrounding sediment into a little chamber in the core. And then when you pull it out of the ground, it, it, it pulls out this column of sediment and these, these cores act almost as like a time capsule into, so you can look at what's been happening in the marsh over time. Um, these are some pictures of my cores. Uh, to the left is a full core. The middle up there is one that I had cut. And then to the right, you, you can't see it too well here, but it's actually, I cut it into one centimeter increments. Um, each core was 40 centimeters long. And I looked at the top two centimeters, the middle two centimeters, and the bottom two centimeters. Um, the top centimeters represent, you know, those were on the, the top of the core. Those represent the most recent, recently deposited sediment. And then as you go down, it goes further and further back in time. Um, so what I did, with the, you can see on the left, the pictures, those are I think those are two different cores that I had set out ready to be weighed. So I weighed each centimeter while it was wet. I dried it and then I weighed it again after it was dry in order to find the percent moisture that each section of the core was holding. So the amount of moisture that the cores are hold that the sediment is holding can tell us a lot about the type of sediment that's there. So I can determine whether it's peat or whether it's sand. Um, and once they were all dried and weighed, I sieved them as well. So I, I put them through a series of sieves to separate the uh, sediment according to grain size. So not only did I have the percent moisture to kind of give me an idea of what kind of sediment it was, but I had the grain size itself. Um, and sediment is globally classified according to grain size. So um, on the next slide, you can see I, those are the, um, the increments that I used for the sieve sizes that I used in order to figure out what kind of sand we had in there. And anything below very fine sand was considered silt, which is peat in my case. Um, you can go to the next slide. So where is the sand going? What did I find? What, what came out of this whole process? Um, it was actually pretty interesting because you can see right off the bat to the left, along the left, the y-axis, we have the weight in grams of each centimeter that I weighed. Uh, for the simplicity's sake and time's sake, I had, I just did graphs. On the left is the top two centimeters, and then on the right I weighed, I uh, graphed the bottom two centimeters so that there's the comparison from the most recent to the oldest amount, the oldest sediment. Um, aside from the one weird little guy on the left graph that's shorter in the middle, on the, all the way to the left, in the middle of those two tall ones. Yeah, so that guy, no, those, yes, those ones, <laughs> sorry. So those, aside from that core, which I'll explain further after, uh, there's clearly a significant difference between the, 
the way it's organized along the x-axis, the ones, the three to the left are the three cores that I took in the front of the marsh. The three in the middle are from the middle of the marsh, and the three to the right are the three that I took in the back of the marsh. The front three cores that I took were clearly much heavier than the ones that I took in the middle and the back of the marsh, which is, it tells me that it was probably made up of sand. Uh, because sand, if you think about holding sand, you have a sand in this hand and you have basically powder, which is what dried silt is. The sand is going to be a lot heavier. Um, the, the funky little guy the, that was a lot lighter on the top was heavy on the bottom. You can see that it was probably made of peat and silt and vegetation probably on the top. And then at the bottom, it was very heavy. So it was made of sand. And if you go to the next slide, I have a graph of the moisture content. And this, this it's, it um, coincides with the first two graphs that we saw. So the top, all the top dots, those are all of the cores from the middle and the back of the marsh. We have that funky little guy, the gray one that goes, I'm sorry, I should explain. On the left is the percent moisture from zero, and it goes up on the y-axis. So that's the percent moisture. The ones along the top are the cores from the middle and the back of the marsh, and they were holding a lot of moisture. So that, that um, tells me that they were probably made of peat. And the bottom two are the heavy ones, which are made of sand. And then that funky guy, it's actually a really cool find because that I looked back at my notes and it was actually made, I made a note that at centimeter 19, you could see with your eyes this distinct difference in the sediment. Like you could see that the bottom half of it was made of sand and that's, that is what I found when I sieved it. Um, so this tells us that the sand is mainly, uh, based on my core samples, that the sand is mainly coming into the front section of the marsh. Unfortunately, I didn't my samples are not representative of the full marsh because even walking through the marsh when I was going to take my cores in the middle and the back section of the marsh, you can see that there's layers of sand on the top of the marsh. That's just not where my random points were you know, taken. So it would be really interesting to get more data on this just to see where, where it's actually going. Um, and what does, so what does this mean for the marsh? Or what could it mean for the marsh? Um, there is, the sand coming into the marsh definitely will change the drainage pattern because it doesn't hold water the way that peat does. And there's a very unique microbial community that lives in the peat. And there have been studies done that show that these, they've compared sandy areas to sandy slash muddy areas to areas that are just peat. And the bacterial population and the peat are much higher than in the sand. Um, and that, that alone can set off a complete, a complete chain reaction in the entire ecosystem. Everything is very interconnected in the, in the salt marsh and in any ecosystem, realistically. But um, we do have. It's, it's exciting in one way because that, that rogue core that I took, that could mean that you know, the sand at the bottom of the core could mean that there was a storm event in the past years that you know, threw sand onto the marsh and then the marsh was able to regrow on top of it because there's peat on top of it. But how long in between storm events, you know, how long did it take for that to start to regrow? I, we would have to do like radiocarbon dating to find that out, and I'm, uh, that's not quite my level of science yet. But <laughs> um, it's, there, there are a lot of questions that could be asked about that. And what, what it comes down to is there is not, I ran into a lot of dead ends trying to find information on f coming up with a conclusion for this project. And it, it, you can actually, I think you can go to the next, the next slide. What, what it comes down to is there isn't enough attention being paid to salt marsh ecosystems and how the dynamics in them work and how everything fits together and how offsetting one factor in the ecosystem could change the rest of the ecosystem and considering 
the importance of the salt marshes and all they do for us and for the environment in general, I really think that it should be looked into more. Um, we need some baseline data in order to track changes that might be happening in the future and we don't have that. So I'm hoping that the you know small amount of research and the small amount of data that I collected you know these past few months could set some kind of foundation for figuring out what's going on in in Folgers Marsh anyway and hopefully someone else can take it a little bit further and do more than I'm capable of doing and that's about it. I want to thank everybody here that came to watch this and um, the, you know, Sarah and everybody for being supportive and providing us with the tools to be able to carry out this research and that's it. Does anybody have any questions? Can I do it again? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> yes, Sarah. Um, well, first of all, I think you hit the nail on the head with the, um, uh, I asked the question and we did research and now we have more questions. So that it needs to be a scientist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so that's a good first step. And um, I was just curious in terms of if you, you or someone else have the ability to kind of continue with this project, let's say this is like a preliminary data year, how would you, redesign a study or do something different or how would you follow up with that? So I actually have thought about that because as I, you know, started putting my data together and like started finding, like looking at what I had, I was like, oh wow, it would be really interesting if I could, I was thinking, and this may not be the best, the best idea, but I was thinking that if I took the, if I took more cores along kind of like a parallel line <laughs> as to where the, the you know the furthest back the, the core was where the sand was present see just to kind of see where it's actually being distributed the cores that I took that were sand were 40 centimeters of sand it wasn't like a little bit of sand it was 40 centimeters of sand and then um, yeah so where I, I would try to find out I wanted I'm interested in making like a profile of like okay well where is the sand what pattern does it coming in it and and how, and I would what I wanted to do one of my goals for this project initially was to actually look at the vegetation and what vegetation is present in these areas and it's just it's I ran out of time I didn't have enough time to do it so I think that would be another interesting thing to add on to there to find out where the sand is going and how the vegetation, like what vegetation is present there or not present there, depending on where the sand is. Um, and I think meticulously saved each I did, yes. I saved everything. So all the cores are still there. Uh, so if anyone is interested in looking at them, the, the, the vegetation is a little ground up. I had to use a mortar and pestle to grind up my, <laughs> my samples in order to sieve them. But uh, there are, I only did the top two, middle two, and bottom two centimeters. So everything else is pretty much intact. It's just dried. So someone could go in and look at the vegetation that's there or, yeah. Yep. And yeah. yeah. Short of carbon dating, have you any way to tell how old some of the deeper cores are? Um, I looked into finding that out, and there is someone who came and cored the marsh to, to find out how old the marsh is, but she hasn't analyzed her data yet. <laughs> so um, it's very, it's, I did some research to try to find an average <coughs> of how much like time one centimeter would represent in, in a core sample, but the accretion rates of marshes are really variable and different depending on where they're located because they depend a lot on sea like how sea level changes and things like that. So it was it was kind of one of those things where it's like I would really love to have that information and that would really help, but I have no way of telling for this marsh in particular. But there are ways there are ways to do it. Calling the sand with storm events or something. Like that. That's what I wanted to do. <laughs> that was what I wanted to do. But is that what it was? Critique from Columbia University used pollen mm -hmm. uh, and, and linked up what pollen grain she saw with the scanning electron microscope throughout the core, which is one way to do it in addition to, to um, radio nuclei. Mm -hmm. uh, but in this case, I think the sand layers are probably going to represent a much shorter period of time. Definitely, yeah. Because these, the sand probably, I feel like one centimeter 
of sand may, uh, there may have been several centimeters of sand that came in either all at once or within the same year, whereas one centimeter of peat would probably represent like, I don't, I'm going to guess and say like 50 years. I could be totally off, but it's, it, there's probably a big difference between how much time sand represents versus peat. Because sand just kind of plops there and nothing happens to it. It doesn't really degrade or anything. It's just the only way it's going to move is if it gets blown away. And you had roots. The roots from last year's plants were at were halfway, like yeah. 18 centimeters. Deep. That's true, too, yeah. So that suggests that maybe 18 centimeters of sand came in recently. Any other questions? Yes. Just a comment. I just, uh, one of the things I found really fascinating about this uh, in addition to learning just how how deeply one could go into reading tea leaves, <laughs> really intriguing, um, is, you know, we talk about global warming and we talk about, you know, rising, uh, you know, rising sea levels. I think most people think about it in sort of a linear fashion. They say, well, it's going to be two inches higher and then another inch higher and everything is going to kind of keep going in the same direction. And th this is a really remarkable to me, as an outsider, uh, illustration of, of how uh, the prospect of increasing, increasingly intense storms in our future, which I think is an established likelihood, um, upsets a balance in a system where random shocks can, can reverberate around and make all sorts of changes that you, know, you can't really predict. You can't. I think you're saying that, you know, I don't know where this is going to go the next big storm because it can do so many different things and upset things in so many different ways. And um, th this is probably a really important baseline of data to have <coughs> on this particular place. And if you do have an opportunity to come back, um, I like the idea of where you're going with, you know, these other ideas. But one thing you might consider would be to go to those identical places and pull up another set of cores, you know, so you can say, Here's what it was in year one. Here's what it was in year n, and it's on the shelf for anybody who wants to figure out what's going on right. 20 years from now. Yeah. Uh, when 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 we've had one or two more intense storms that may have completely altered the landscape here. Right. It's a it's a really interesting study. It's it's. This is. I feel like this is a very, because of how much that barrier beach has you know been blown over yeah. there. I feel like this marsh is particularly, I mean, maybe they all are. This is the only one I looked at, so I guess I can't speak for other marshes. But I feel like this one is really at risk to just be, for that front front portion of that marsh to just be covered completely in sand. And um, in the marsh ecosystems, the, the plants have a relationship with each other where the processes of one grass benefit the process of, of the next grass. And even though they grow in different areas, if one is affected, the next one is going to be affected as well. So if, if that front half of the mar if that front part of the marsh is covered in sand, that's going to affect the kind of grass that grows right beyond that sand, and it's it it could keep going back. So if we have sea level coming up, and I get I'm not really I just lost my thought. Yeah, once it, that's going to keep rolling and it's going to keep pushing the growth back and back and back, and eventually it could get to the point where it's not even a marsh anymore. It's just but you sort of said, you, know, you, you kind of got, you got a cross-section map of the way it's working now, and you're saying you can start to see these influences operating, and you can envision what could happen in the future. And anybody who's talking about their own personal salt marsh could say, you know, this could happen in my salt marsh. Right. Because it's happening in different places right now. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that's what I think is so interesting about this as a kind of a case study. You know, you're sort of studying a patient with a with a disease and saying these are all the manifestations and uh, the way it happens is there's a lot of interconnected things and there's no way to tell where it's going to lead it just depends on random outside events right and it's also it, I really I really hope that it does provide a baseline for someone to come and do more research because I'm I, maybe I'll come back and maybe. do some more because now I'm really interested yeah. in it and I want to know what's going to happen <laughs> I'm so I I do have to write a scientific paper, so. <laughs> have you been tracking or um, paying attention to um, 
your intrusion into the marsh and the effects that it's having on the marsh as a sidebar or in any way looking at that? I've thought about it, but I haven't looked at it. I do feel bad every time I step into, <laughs> every time I step into the marsh and I'm like, oh, I just pulled out this section of sediment. I wonder what this is going to do. But I haven't, I haven't looked at it. You should probably not do it any more damage. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. That was Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Hello, my name is Serena Saeed. Thank you all for joining me here for my presentation on terrestrial macrofauna of Nantucket and the defects of disturbance on them. Um, next slide. So basically, I was going off of a study that another local scientist, Andrew McKenna Foster, had done. He helped me with my project. These were the sites he had looked at during one of his studies between the burn areas and the mowed areas for uh, the Smooth Hummocks Coastal Preserve right here. And basically, I was looking at the management of these sites as a disturbance. Now, I only looked at the mode sites from, for my particular presentation, but uh, he looked at all of that. So basically, I was looking at the maintenance of mowing on the habitats of the sand plain grasslands that he looked at, and the year of occurrence, he took all his samples in 2008. And so what I was looking at is the insects he collected in these samples. So there were mostly arthropods. I did have a couple of other things that got into the samples, like mollusks. I got snails and things. And I basically was looking at the effects of disturbance on those populations. Next slide. So by disturbance, it would be the effect of mowing. And by the habitat maintenance, so I was looking at the annual disturbance of mowing um, mowing in 2007, and then mowing in 2005, 2003, and then uh, no mowing as the control. So I basically said to myself, if we have high diversity in these areas, there should be less disturbance. And generally, that's the way it goes. And next slide. And so it's basically in that I categorized the habitat and the disturbance. And I basically examined his pitfall traps from that study and quantified all of the insects in them. I spent pretty much nine hours a day in the basement of the Mariah Mitchell sorting through bugs. <laughs> That's basically what I did. And I assessed the effect of those disturbances on the numbers I had gotten on the counts of these bugs, basically. And, oh, I thought I deleted that slide. Oops. Okay. Next slide. So basically, after doing all of that and counting all of these insects, I quantified the diversity index. So this is what I got for counting up all those bugs. It, for, the, for the annual. So basically, the Shannon index is quantifying the number of a particular species, or in my case, I was looking at orders. So I was quantifying the numbers per order that I had found and dividing it by the total number of orders that I found. So I had 13 total orders and various counts amongst them. So the indices here show that value. And then the evenness for those values was taking the calculated value of the Shannon index over that ideal. And for that, the evenness varied also. We had some various things in 2005, which is quite funny when we get to the next slide. And the ANOVAs and the games howl um, tests that I did help correlate what I was seeing here, which are shown in the next slide. These three particular orders were pretty much steady in quantifying the disturbance and their values. So basically what we're looking at is we're looking at the disturbance 
over. It was kind of a shift. The year seven five yeah. three. So we're looking at the year of the disturbance over. I really should have labeled this better. Number of orders. Uh, no, that was. Um, No, those were the average mean values for the orders. That's what that was. Okay. So those were the average means of what I had counted with the standard error bars. So as you can see, if in like the coleoptera for the control, there was no disturbance and they preferred that or a little bit of disturbance, but they were pretty much low across the board with disturbance. Can you remind us what, so this 7, 2007 is low disturbance? Yeah, because it was mowed in 2007, so it was the year prior to when Andrew had done the study. And so in 2005, it was three years prior, and then 2003 is five years prior, and then annuals every year. For those folks that don't know, can you say what uh, Dakota is? And okay, so uh, Coleoptera is basically beetles. Beetles, okay. Hymenoptera is your ants, your wasps, your bees. Mm -hmm. um, I actually didn't see any bees. I saw mostly ants and wasps because wasps are ground nesting. Mm -hmm. um, if you ask me what species I had, I have not a clue <laughs> because I only went down to order. But uh, an isopo isopoda is isopods, basically your pill bugs and your sow bugs. Okay. And so looking at these means, you can see that they kind of like some disturbance and annual disturbance. Going back to that, while the hymenopter really like their disturbance. So um, that may just be a preference between the orders because some might need the loose soil produced by a disturbance or the variance in ve vegetation mm -hmm. for the um, successional plants that we were looking at for these maintained areas. Um, you can go to the next slide. So obviously my results varied. I only put the three best graphs of that up there, but some of my results were off the charts because I had high counts for some things. Like I had really high counts for isopoda, but they average it out across mm -hmm. all of the uh, treatment, all of the uh, disturbance years. However, some of them like columbula, which are basically your springtails, they, I had really one high count in 2005 that could very easily skew my results. And so, so I had a lot of that happen where I had low counts or high counts of some things that really varied the rest of my data. And I would find it really interesting to look into some of those things because it's relevant. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's showing up on my graphs, meaning it got to be coming from somewhere or something. Uh, next slide. And really, I want to go much further into that because I find this interesting. This, this, this is my life. Mm -hmm. And that's that's pretty much what I found. Basically, what I've seen in, my tr in what I looked at is that some, in some of the orders like disturbance, some of them do not. Um, I'm not sure how to really quantify that because my results were so varied, but it's something to look at, something for further research. Somebody could easily take this. I've saved all of my data, all of my counts, and I'm going to leave it with the, Ramai the Mariah Mitchell so that someone can go in and continue it. Did you actually save all the insects, each in the, you know, the piles of insects, or did you just... They're all still in the vials. Okay. I just looked at them, I did my counts, and put them back in the vials. So I've quantified all that data, everything I saw in them. And if I couldn't identify it, I turned to Andrew and said, what is this? <laughs> and that was a lot of it. And so I really owe him a big thank you for letting me do that. And to some of the other people in this room that have me here, especially UMass Boston and 
Elizabeth Boyle who allowed me to come here and do this because this was really fascinating. Any questions? I wanted to point out or make sure this was all material that Andrew probably could never have gotten to. So this is leftover pitfall trap material that had already had the ants and the harvestmen picked out of them for another project. So funny thing about that. Yep. I actually found some spiders and harvestmen that he had missed. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> So this is, this is using stuff that, you know, when you go to the trouble of trapping insects out in the field in different locations, you generate these huge biological samples that then you want to keep, but a lot of times they said for field stations around the world, this is very common, you'll have huge, you know, vials of, of poor little creatures that gave their lives to science, but they, you don't have the, the manpower, the woman power to come and sort through them and actually be able to do the science on the leftover species. So this was a great help for Mari Mitchell and for Andrew for someone to go through and even just put it into orders. Someone who is a full-time bug specialist would be able to get it down to genuses probably. But uh, Serena did an amazing job, very methodical job, going through something that it would be very hard for him to find someone to take the time to do. So this is one of the things we're trying to achieve the Nantucket semester is take care of some of these samples that otherwise are going to sit moldering in our labs until the end of time. Yeah. So this was all with Andrew's collection. You yeah. didn't actually collect some yourself. You just I wish I had. It them. would have been just as interesting if I had. In January, they're not really. It's a little harder. <laughs> February, they're not. Summer semester. Yeah. But yeah, I was telling Alicia in the restroom that I was literally spending nine hours a day in the basement of the Mariah Mitchell while it was cold and, you know, mucky, you know, and, and I would sit down there in front of a heater and tiny little bugs all day. Yes. So that, I just want to clarify. So you know, the samples were all collected in 2008. Yes. And then the management regime um, for the different properties, so that there was um, the annual was it a property or a unit or whatever it is that um, got mowed every year. Yeah. If you can go back to that first yeah. map. And then there were some that were mowed in 2005, and then nothing happened until the sampling. Right. And then okay. Because that's basically how Andrew did this study. So mm -hmm. those black holes are basically what he looked at. So he was looking at the burn areas and the mode areas in terms of their management, mm -hmm. which is where the samples come from. He just hasn't had time to sort through them yet and put the data into some logical form to be used by someone. So just out of curiosity and kind of um, looking at your numbers and how they related to the different management, do you know if I'm assuming, like, when, when the area is mowed, um, the vegetation, the slash, you know, just, mm -hmm. like, stays on the plot. I... It's so really interesting, because I thought, you, like, the... I, I didn't... The isopods that were really high in some of the more recent... Yeah. ...mows, like, I mean, I just know pill bugs. They mm -hmm. like to go under things. So I'm just... I think it's interesting when you look at how that changes so quickly over... Mm -hmm. I just wanted to clarify because I was thinking through it and I wanted to make sure I had it right for this. Yeah, that's one thing I had noticed with the pill bugs that uh, it could be because they're under something. I don't know what they did with the brush and stuff after they mowed it or if they left it there for uh, basically helping with the successional growth of the area. Um, I know they do burns in the area too and so I don't know if that might have had an effect on it either. Can I ask a quick <coughs> question then I'll let Peter ask? So the taller yeah. the bar, I just didn't quite, uh, I, I don't know much about population diet. The taller this bar, the more diversity, the more diverse it is? Uh, basically what this is, is for the numbers I had gotten, uh, this is the average mean okay. of the numbers I gotten. The number you counted. The number yeah. counted, not the... It's yeah, the number I counted. Over species, so some species, that represents how many she counted in that order. Yeah. Okay. But it couldn't represent both. Yeah, I get you. Okay, I, I just wasn't sure. Peter, go ahead. Yeah, just one suggestion for when you make the presentation again. Um, it would be helpful if you labeled this. Um, I, the, you know, I noticed okay. that as I was going through I would it. Say the, don't label it by year. Label it by, uh, you know, years since mode. Yeah. So, you know, some measure says it was mode 
just mowed mowed two years ago, four years ago, whatever. Yeah. And then so I'm still confused. The vertical axis is that uh, zero is less diversity. The top is more diversity. It's basically the same question. See, so it's the average mean of the what I counted for the sample. Okay, but I mean the concept would be diversity. Though, is that right? Yeah. Okay, so so you might you might put something up that just says diversity index or you know yeah your diversity at the top. I just, yeah, I just, the first time through, it's hard for me as as a person who is a, in a totally different scientific. Field, yeah. I just want to get the big picture, which is uh, there's variation here, and I want to see what it is that's varying. So it's actually the number of individuals in those orders. Yeah. So if you've got yeah. eight bees yeah. in M07, that to me that tells you you got eight, or I'm sorry, eight Calactra. Yeah. Yeah. Versus um, that same year, I would actually graph everything with just the year in each of the different orders on a graph. So I would have the so you would the you would do it by order and then onto all M7s, all yeah. M05s. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, oh, yeah, yeah. No, there's a yeah, bar chart. Otherwise, it doesn't, part. That's what, that's what it doesn't tell me anything. Yeah. It would be interesting, too, to see the previous slide was the diversity index indices and, yeah. the, um, and the evenness. It would be nice to see those in a figure. I could see the numbers, but it's nice to see the overall diversity in a figure, mm -hmm. just for if you're for write up and stuff. Yeah. Because um, um. it's nice to see. So if you're looking at like the, the Shannon index, um, the most diverse plots are the the control, control and the and the ML5. So yeah. The one that was only mowed two years. Three years ago. Or three years. When ago, the study was taken. The most diverse. Followed by the control and then the annual mowing. Right? Okay. Yeah. Right. So the higher <laughs> that number is, see, this is something I don't know. The higher the yeah. Shannon index, the, the more diverse. Yeah. That would be a good thing to have on the slide. Yeah. Just Shannon index means the higher this number, the more diverse. Yeah. Um, and even this, I still don't understand either. It's, it's how that they're distributed. So the, the Shannon index is overall diversity, but um, even this is how e um, even are they distributed each other, right? So like yeah. the means different equal lots, numbers. they could have the same diversity level, but completely different species. Right? Yeah. yeah. Right? So the evenness is. Could have, you could have the same number of species or orders in each plot, but some orders may have 500 individuals and some orders may have two individuals. Is that that's kind of funny you make that as a point because that's kind of what I was noticing. Because in the MO5, um, I did find uh, cockroaches in the MO5 and no other treatment did I find them. MO5 also had that really high number of uh, springtails, which is why that number is probably as high as it is. You know, the fact that we've been talking about these measures for this long <laughs> convinces me that there's a real simple solution here. Yeah. What, you do, what you do is you take three little dishes, okay? And in one of them you put really diverse or high order or whatever you want to show, you know, eight bees, one spider, and yeah. you know, whatever. And just say, this is what it looks like when you have this kind of a measure. And then you have another one that shows some other kind of extreme or lack of extreme. Yeah. If you have the picture, just say, these are the measures. This is what they show. This is what they're indexing. Yeah. You know, one place is, is all one type and only one other person. Or, I mean, only one other bug. All the rest were the same type of bug. Yeah. And another one where it's a mixture and there's about equal proportions of three or four or five different types of bugs. So people get a sense of right away what I'm getting here are, you know, all those concepts together in a real life situation. He does this with people. And when you goes to and if, and I mean, unless you're that. talking to an audience of people who are exactly in this field, it, uh, it, it'll it'll <laughs> get you real short circuited to where they'll understand what the measure is. Yeah. I knew the Shannon index was an important index, but I, 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 until now I didn't understand what it was what it was measuring. But now I think I do. But a picture would give it to me right away. Yeah. Um, I might make some adjustments after yeah. this to and make it. I'm to buy another set of eyes of somebody in a different field and say, do you get the picture right away? <laughs> yeah, when I go home, that'll be the rest yeah. of my family. Yeah. Right, right. Nice. 
but additional questions we're right at four o'clock and then on time anybody else have any questions no i want to thank everyone for attending thank you serena excellent job you're welcome and uh, we're looking forward to the next nantucket semester whether it's it might not be this fall but definitely next spring uh, we hope we get a lot of applicants so definitely send in your applications and talk to either myself, Sarah Okai, at the Nantucket Field Station or our Nantucket <coughs> coordinator, Dr. Beth Boyle. Thanks to NCTV uh, Channel 18. This will be shown on NCTV. And thanks to everyone here on Nantucket, including Remain Nantucket, for helping us uh, have a successful semester. And we'll see you all again soon.